fun from all over the world. Yeah, the, today we really have people from all over the world. We even have uh, trainers from uh, the American continent. So, and thank you for for staying uh, really late for us. It's now 10 p.m. Uh, for for our trainers. So, um, thank you so much for joining us. Today uh, marks our third workshop, uh, which titled uh, Disrupt Disruptive Innovation and Investors' Expectations. So I, my name is Suki. I'm your coordinator for the Karak University Startup Generator 2023. Um, today, uh, we will do, as always, a brief progress review of the challenge. And we'll go on to our training session then followed by a Q&A. Right, let me uh, start with the progress review. And as you're aware, this Correct University Startup Generator Challenge is sponsored by Asian Development Bank and the Republic of Korea E-Asia and Knowledge Partnership Fund. And this is for university students from the Correct region to um, generate innovative solutions. And at the moment we are in week five. So we've, we've gone through a lot together already. And in this week, we have this workshop, of course, and we also have a business plan and a mom test task and here. So I will, I will talk more about the, the task a bit later. I want to give you a brief um, statistic review. Everyone's always very interested about this, um, the data. So uh, we talked last time that we start the competition with 168 teams that represent 580 students across 10 countries in the correct region. Now we're in week five. So this week we have selected 30 teams and 109 students to, to proceed. And that is 18% of the original registered teams and students. Um, and we are expecting to have um, four winners at the end of the challenge. So, um, so yeah, this is the statistic for now. If you are still here uh, among the 30 teams, I would say that you're already winning. So uh, please hang on and keep the good work. Uh, we hope, we really hope to see you on the final pitching day. And of course, we want to see you in the, in the uh, award ceremony as well. Now, uh, let's quickly talk about the weeks. You probably have seen this week's task already. So uh, basically this week, we, we are expecting to um, start drafting the business plan and uh, use this uh, tour, the mom test, to validate the, the ideas that you already um, um, created and discussed. And in week six, so week six, the week of uh, 13th of March until the 19th of March, we will see Jeff and Carl again for the fourth workshop, which will help us to better understand our customers' values. And the two tasks for, for next week will be um, to think about the competitive advantages of your solution. And as well as this is very important to start preparing your pitch deck. So um, here I, I write just very brief task, but in uh, when you log into the platform, when the week six task is released, you will be able to see more information and introduction and also guidance on how to prepare for your pitch deck uh, when you uh, when week six arrives. So please note that we are selecting the uh, 10 teams to proceed to the demo day. So the quality of your pitch deck really matters and we hope uh, you will really spend time and efforts on preparing your pitch deck. And please feel free to also ask questions if you have any to, to the admins, to the mentors, to the trainers. On week seven, which is two weeks from now, you will be start 
preparing for your pitching and we would like to uh, we would like you to record a five minutes video of your pitching and, and upload to the systems so your team can have one or two members one is idea of course we, we welcome you to have more than one uh, two members at most to to do the pitching presentation uh, using english of course mm -hmm. and on the 24th of march which is a friday we will be organizing a mock pitching and uh, this this session will then allow you to to do a pitching to rehearse your pitching and we will invite the mentors to come and listen to your pitching and, and provide also feedbacks to help you to improve and it's also a great opportunity to hear from other teams on their solutions their ideas and of course also their presentation skills so yeah i per, i'm personally really looking forward to this this mock pitching session And finally, we'll have our pitching, uh, the pitching day. Yeah, we also call it demo day. For the, as the final session of this challenge, 10 teams will be selected to pitch their solutions. And you're very welcome to invite your families, friends, teachers, whoever you want to invite to come and witness your, your presentation. So, um, and more details of the pitching day will also be announced later on the platform. Um, you probably are very, very familiar with this award and benefit page. So um, I'm, I'm just gonna quickly uh, go to the, the next page. I think we've repeated this so many times. So uh, I want to remind you the selection criteria of, the, um, of, of this challenge. Of course, uh, innovative, innovativeness, technology, market, your presentation skills, and your team coordination. And um, so I want to highlight innovativeness as it's our first selection criteria here. And it's also very closely related to today's training session. You probably want to know, so how, how do we create disruptive innovation? How, how, how can we improve our innovativeness so if you want to know more about innovativeness and you want to stay and listen to uh, mr jeff Wallace and Carduch for the for their training uh, so both of our trainers today and they're they're no stranger to us they have already uh, delivered two amazing training to us both of them are founders ceos speakers startup advisors and ng investors more than that and one of their one of their um company one of their startups the silicon valley in your pocket uh, company is actually a mobile platform that uh, connects global entrepreneurs to silicon valley training content and coaching and and uh, resources so yeah uh, without further ado, I would like to now give the floor to Mr. Jeff and Carl. Welcome, and the floor is now yours. Thank you very, very much, and uh, thank you for kind of teeing up our discussion today, because, yeah, I'll share my screen, <laughs> and we'll go through some of our discussion on disruptive innovation, and um, we're looking forward to sharing this, this with all of you today. So let me make sure my screen is going to come through. I'm trying to select an option here on the share. It's not letting me. Huh. It's not letting me share with sound for some reason. Maybe that's a webinar uh, feature, I don't know. Have you had issues, uh, Shuki, sharing with sound before or have you tried this? Uh, I think we should choose from the uh, microphone. There is option. Normally when you do share screen, you have, there's an option share sound, but it's not allowing me to uh, select it for some reason. I'm not sure why.
no, it's not working. We may go without sound and we'll see what we do. You can see my screen here, I hope. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay, yep. so there is one portion of this that has a video that normally it has sound. It doesn't look like it's been allowing me to share with sound today. So we'll go without it. Um, I actually believe you'll be able to get uh, quite a bit out of the video the same way um, without the sound. And we'll see what we can do to maybe I'll play if I play it here and put my microphone to the speaker, maybe it'll work. But let me get started by introducing myself and Cal. As uh, Shruki uh, mentioned, Cal and I have had quite a bit of experience working with um, ADB and, and Karik and, and Iraqli. And, and for actually several years, we've been working with Iraqli and other groups that he's been so generous to bring us into. So we're very appreciative here to talk with you today about disruptive innovation and what investors in Silicon Valley are looking for when we talk about innovation and specifically disruptive innovation. So we'll start with just a little introduction of myself. Um, for those that haven't seen any of our work before, um, the companies here on the left side of the screen, um, starting over here with Merrill Lynch and CSC, these companies here are companies I've worked for during my career. I started my career on Wall Street, and then I moved into technology. And then many, many years ago, I started our, our company, Global Kinetics, to really do a lot of technology uh, work with companies and with startups. The companies all the way here on the right are really from all over the world. This is just a sampling of companies that I've had the good opportunity to work with. These are startup uh, ecosystems where they're helping many, many startups work. There's a sampling of government work here, accelerator programs from all across the world. And then I'll quickly wrap it up with my fun fact. One of the fun parts of my journey as an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley is I've had the opportunity to work with both Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, the two co-founders of Apple. I worked with Steve Jobs a long time ago, back in the 90s in one of my startups. And then later on in uh, the 2010s, about seven or eight years ago, I had the opportunity to work. I began an opportunity to work with Steve Wozniak, who I've worked with several times. I'll turn it to Cal to do a quick introduction of himself as well. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, let me first say um, I will probably spend less time on the startups because you'll realize that a lot of these logos are the exact same ones. Jeff and I have had the pleasure of working together for about eight years or so. So a lot of the projects have been the same. Um, I will say that I started my career at really big companies like Wells Fargo Bank, one of the biggest banks here in the United States, Visa, the credit card company, which I'm sure you've heard of, and PricewaterhouseCoopers, is the big accounting firm. Um, after the ascent of the big companies, I did join some smaller startups, and I have never looked back. And in the last eight years, I've just had the pleasure of working with startups around the world. I'll highlight a couple that, uh, uh, just to build on what Jeff was talking about, Battery is one of the accelerators that we co-founded that's based in Berkeley. Silicon Valley in Your Pocket is another virtual accelerator that we have founded. And we also had the pleasure of working a lot at UC Berkeley, one of the leading universities and centers of entrepreneurial excellence around the world. And we actually took our program and got to translate it into Spanish with UC Berkeley and make it available for the Latin American market. Um, and then just lastly, my little fun fact is uh, a company I created, icefan.com, but not as a business, but as a subject for what is called a mockumentary, a mock documentary. It basically told the story of a fictitious company in a documentary style. And uh, it actually uh, ended up on the uh, film festival circuit. There's a very famous festival here called Sundance uh, that was started by a famous actor, Robert Redford. And uh, I somehow got into it. It was a lot of fun. But basically, we wanted to have a little bit of fun and kind of make fun of uh, startups that are actually kind of bad ideas and yet somehow get venture capital funding. And uh, so Jeff is actually going to now get, jump into some, some important tips about how you are attractive to investors. And at the same time, you're producing a good company. So with that, Jeff, I'll uh, pass it back to you. Thanks so much, Cal. So moving on here, I'm going to, since we're really representing Silicon Valley tonight, I, I thought it would be nice to share a, a few facts 
about Silicon Valley. And when you hear the term Silicon Valley, just to give you some context, there's this area down here on the map that is Silicon Valley, but they also now start to include San Francisco and even over here by Berkeley. So when you hear people talk about Silicon Valley, they're really talking about these three circle, these three areas that are a little bit highlighted and in these red circles. And those three areas, when you look at them, they represent a $3 trillion neighborhood, if you will, um, a, an economy that would represent $3 trillion. That's just these three circles, not all of this area outside the circles, just the three circles here. And if you looked at them, as their own country, for example, they would represent the world's 18th largest economy, just these three circles again. The startup ecosystem here in Silicon Valley is three times bigger than New York City, four, times, four and a half times bigger than London, and 12 and a half times bigger than Berlin, all of which are really powerful and strong and vibrant startup ecosystems. It's just that much bigger here in Silicon Valley. And when you think about venture capital, which we hear a lot about venture capital when we're trying to raise money for our startups and for earlier stage or, and even later stage businesses, 30% of global VC and 50% of all VC in the US comes out of these three circles. So it's a very, very powerful um, geography and it's really multicultural. Silicon Valley is very multicultural. We get asked a lot when we're working with groups that are outside of the U.S., would, would I be accepted there in Silicon Valley? And that's speaking as the other people who are asking us. And the fact is that over a third, 36.4% um, of the entire population here are actually not born here in the United States. They're foreign born. And more than half of the tech startups that were started here were started by people not born in the United States. So we often joke and say, not only would you be accepted, you'd almost be more accepted than Cal and I. And Cal was born here. So it's just a very, very interesting place. And I want to show the scale. So it looks kind of like big on this map. But if I were to go to the next screen and I showed you the entire state of California, this is what it represents on the state map. And remember, California is just one state in the United States. So when I show you that circle in the United States, you're going to see, oh, excuse me, you're going to see it's a very tiny little circle here. That little circle is all of these things. That little circle alone is the 18th largest economy in the entire world. It's really an amazing example of how powerful uh, startup ecosystem Silicon Valley really represents. So one of the things that most people don't think about and that contributes to that is that when you think of Silicon Valley, a lot of people think over here in the technology sector or over here, oh, sorry, over here in the electronics sector, Apple and Hewlett Packard and Intel, all these big companies or here maybe Facebook and Google um, Salesforce, Yahoo, these are the companies people think of. But look at all of these other industries, aerospace, apparel, automotive, biotechnology, energy, entertainment with Netflix, as an example, or Pixar, or Sega in gaming, all these financial institutions, including two that Cal himself worked at here. And then it's just the breadth of companies that are represented here is really quite broad. And that's one of the things that allows Silicon Valley to be so innovative across so many industries, because so many industries are actually here and are willing to engage the technology and the innovation that's happening here to help create all of the great innovations that we see coming out of Silicon Valley. Now, we often hear this term, you may be familiar with it, uh, called disruptive innovation. And I think it's fair when we talk about terms that we should really define what we mean when we're talking about terms, particularly when we're presenting to people who are not in our environment and may not be as familiar with the terminology. So a disruptive innovation is an innovation that creates a new market and a new value network, creating value throughout that network. And it eventually disrupts 
an existing market and value network, displacing the established market leading firms, products, and alliances. What that means is it's something new that comes and disrupts the old. Whatever was the established, it gets disrupted by something new. And they tend to be disrupted from outside the industry. It's not often that the industry disrupts itself and takes over and disrupts its own um, established uh, business. So typically, disruptive innovators are from the outside of an industry, looking into an industry and thinking, we have a better way of working in the way that industry works. Now, a lot of people think this term is a very new term, but it was actually defined um, in 1995. So what is that? Almost 18 years ago. This term's been around a long time. Clay Christensen was a gentleman out of Harvard who really created this term called disruptive innovation. Now, I'll ask you by way of a chat in the chat, if you could type in some thoughts who are disruptive companies that come to your minds? If you have the ability to just type a name into chat, there's no rights, there's no wrongs. Just I'm curious, give me a couple of examples who you guys think of when I ask who is a disruptive company. So I'll give you guys a few seconds to type in an answer to the chat window and just give us a sense of who you think are disruptive companies in the industries. Don't be bashful, guys. Give me some answers here. Come on. I'll give you some thoughts. Again, there's no rights, no wrongs. Uber, thank you very much. I see one guess is Uber. Who else? Just take one or two more, and then we'll go on, and I'll start sharing a couple other examples. I see hands going up, but I'm not seeing anything in the chat. So I'm going to go on here, but we've got Uber. I think you guys will agree with me when I say companies like, oh, there you go, Airbnb. I'm going to start with Amazon. Amazon was a huge disruptor in originally in the book industry, and now they were a disruptor in everything e-commerce. They sell everything. OpenAI is a great one in today's day and age. It's a fantastic example. Google and Netflix, fantastic examples. Airbnb is one of the ones we touch on here. Uber, also something that was put into the list you guys gave. Netflix, I think you guys are hitting them all. And Tesla, you know, when you think about automotive, Tesla has really done a huge disruption to the automotive space. And so these are just some examples. I think the ones you guys are giving, OpenAI, Neuralink, these are Google, these are all great uh, examples as well. So thank you for the contribution. I now want to get into, if we, we seem to agree on what companies we would describe as truly disruptive. So then we start to think to ourselves, well, what is the value of being a disruptor? What value does being disruptive bring to a company? We know it brings great disruption to a market, but what value does it bring to the company that created the disruptive innovation? So a couple of examples I'll share here, and I'll start over on the left. I'm going to put them all up, but I'm going to start on the left. So Uber, one of the first ones that was put into our little chat window there, without manufacturing or owning any vehicles, Uber is worth more than 1.3 times Ford Motor Company, 1.2 and change times General Motors, and more than double Fiat Chrysler. These are long-standing decades and decades of longevity companies, and Uber with no manufacturing and no ownership of the vehicles is worth multiples of these stalwarts, these established players in the industry. When we look at Amazon, Amazon became just the second company in the United States to reach $1 trillion in market value, and it's worth more than one and a half times that of Walmart, Costco and Target. These are three of our largest retailers here in the United States. And Amazon is worth more than one and a half times all of them combined. These are enormous values that Uber and Amazon have been able to obtain. Thinking about Tesla in the automotive space, Tesla is valued. This one always blows my mind. They're valued at more than Toyota, Porsche, Mercedes, 
Volkswagen, BMW, General Motors, and Ford combined, and yet they produce less than 1% of all vehicles. Disruption has its benefits. Airbnb, similarly, is worth more than twice two huge established hotel chains here in the United States and globally, Marriott and Hyatt. It's worth more than the two of them combined, and it's worth more than twice Hilton, another global um, hotel chain. And then lastly, we talked about Netflix. Netflix in 2003, Blockbuster was the real big um, company here in, in the United States that marketed movies and um, either tapes or DVDs. And they reached a valuation when they had over 9,000 stores around the United States. They were worth at $5 billion at that time. And Netflix in that time was worth one half of a billion, one tenth of what Blockbuster was worth when at early stage, when it was a very young company. But seven years later, Blockbuster went out of business, and today Netflix is worth $142 billion, nearly 30 times Blockbuster's highest valuation, and they had 9,000 stores. Netflix has no stores. So these are immense values that can be created when you're one of the disruptors, and I think we're seeing some others like the ones you guys have mentioned uh, either Neuralink or, or OpenAI that are creating massive disruption, and they will probably be rewarded with similar valuation and value over time. So the question then is, being a, a disruptor really is hugely valuable. So the natural instinct is to say, well, I wanted to be a disruptor. How do we achieve disruption? You're all working on projects right now. You should be thinking about how can we achieve value? One surefire way of creating value is to be a disruptor. So how do we achieve disruption? Well, we look for markets that are ripe for being disrupted, meaning they're really ready to be disrupted. I don't know if any of you have ever taken a taxi. I don't know. A taxi in the earlier days was how people would get around. You'd flag a taxi, you'd get in, and you'd go from point A to point B. If you asked taxi drivers on a one to 10 scale, how exciting and how fun is it to ride in the taxi, I think they would laugh at you and they wouldn't even give you a number. But if you ask people about Uber, and Uber saw that. They knew people needed to transport from A to B, but nobody really enjoyed the experience. And they thought, we can do this better. And so they looked and said, the taxi industry is ripe for being disrupted. Similarly, Netflix saw the opportunity to disrupt the industry they were in. They said, you know, people are starting to be able to use the internet. This was in the earlier days of the internet. And we're soon going to be able to just download files like movies and television shows, you won't need to be sending them in the mail like they were doing. You won't need to have stores like Blockbuster was doing. They saw that it was ripe for disruption and they made a move. And they realized that because there's, there's new technologies that helped facilitate the disruption. With Uber, every one of us is walking around with a device that tells the world exactly where we are. We have payment methods on it. Um, I can summon an Uber car from my phone wherever I'm standing. Similarly, Netflix, as I said, they saw the internet bandwidth getting faster and faster, being able to handle more and more data. And these movies and sh shows like that, videos are much higher amounts of data. But they realized new technologies were going to facilitate these disruptions. And they didn't get caught up in the old paradigms. They looked at the rules of the way things were being done, and they didn't say, like a lot of established companies say, well, we do it this way because that's the way we always have done it. That's what established companies say. Disruptors say, I don't care if that's the way we've always done it. We're going to blow that up, and we're going to do it in a much better way, and we're going to leverage new technologies and create value by being disruptive. And they always think big or go home. That's an expression we use here in America. Um, you, in spe specifically here in Silicon Valley, it's think big or go home. Nobody wants incremental change. I don't want a taxi ride to be a little bit 
more enjoyable. I want to change it and get in someone's personal car who cares about their car, who takes good care of it. It's a nicer experience. So similarly, all of these disruptors, Amazon, they thought big. They were going to change the world, and they have. Um, OpenAI or, or Chat uh, GPT, the, co the parent company of Chat GPT, they are looking to think big or go home right now. And lastly, every one of these companies had a plan. They executed the plan. They had to make adjustments. And oftentimes in startup lingo, you'll hear the term pivot. They made adjustments, they pivoted maybe, and then they keep on plowing forward. Netflix didn't start out with, as the company you might be aware who they are today. Uber did not start out as the company you know them to be today. Uber started out as a way for people to use limousines that were being underutilized. Now look at what they are around the world. So these companies made adjustments. They pivoted in the middle of their execution, but they kept on moving forward. And that's the key thing here. So take these things to heart. These are great examples of the companies we're talking about that did this exact recipe in, its, in their own ways to create the values they've created. Now, I'm going to ask an example here. I'm going to ask you guys again in the chat window, and please do um, give me a couple of responses here. How long, if I said to you, I have a flat piece of land and I want to build a three-bedroom, two-bathroom house with a garage that looks like that little picture down there, I want to build that house. How long do you think it would take for me to do that? I'm starting with just a piece of land, and I'm curious to know how long you think it might take us to build a three-bedroom, two-bath house. So by way of just typing in whatever your guess is of how much time it would take into the chat window, just give me some ideas, whatever you think. Again, there's no right answers here, and there's no wrong answers here. I'm just curious how long you think it would take. Thank you, Murdan. I see one estimate of about three months. Give you guys a, few, a little bit of time here. One year. Thank you, Shuki. Four to five months. Oh, someone's guessing two hours. That's a good one. Let's go on and, oh, one week, a few months to a year. All right. So on average, wow, more than four years. On average, we're looking at several months uh, to, to, I'd say on average, it's probably about a several months guess. And here, 20 days in the last one. Thank you, Rustam. One month as well. So let's go now and take a look. Now, you might not hear the audio here. I'm going to do my best, if I can, on my own computer to put this microphone near the speaker. So I'm going to hit play and take a look at this. It's about three minutes long, just so you know.
Okay. Were you guys able to hear any of that sound or was there no sound? No, there so was one no person sound. saying no sound. Well, I apologize for the sound not working. I'm gonna thank Zoom. You can you can hear me as well. You're fine now, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I apologize for the sound, but hopefully you got a chance to see that video. It came in in about two hours and 50 some minutes. <clears throat> we did have one guess at two hours. So you even beat our, our actual uh, world record here. Now, let me show you what I want you to take away from that. Why do you think we guessed as we guessed? We guessed on average several months, not, not several hours. We had one person guess two hours, but we guessed on average several months. And the reason we guess the way we do is we have in our heads this, this set of rules that are driving our guess. They're helping form the basis of our guess. So for example, there's natural rules like um, concrete needs time to set. But in the video, they used, they talked about it. Unfortunately, you didn't get to hear it, but they talked about using an accelerant a technology, a chemical technology to accelerate the, the setting of concrete. Normally it needs 24 hours. Concrete in the way they did it needed 15 minutes. So they used something to change the um, speed with which concrete could set and be used from which they could start to walk on it and do the other work around it without having to delay. Similarly, there are rules of thumb. These are just established beliefs. You know, we think, well, if you put up walls first, then you could put the roof on. But if you noticed in the video, they were building the walls in one area and they were building the roof in a different area. So they didn't have to do the walls before they did the roof. They just, they didn't have to build the walls before they did the roof. They were building the walls and the roof at the same time. So they changed some things in the way we think about it or processed our guesses. And the last one is rules of value or trade-offs. We all think you can't have it, as they say, cheap, fast, or good. You get to pick two, but you can't have all three. Now, you're going to see in that video, there were a lot of people and a lot of um, technology, like a lot of equipment. So it wasn't cheap, but it was fast and it was good. So they got two, but they didn't get the third in that case. Now, what enabled that record or that uh, disruption, excuse me, to take place the way it did First and foremost, you might have noticed there was a gentleman going through a list of plans. There was intense planning. There's an expression, if you fail to plan, plan to fail. In this case, they did intense planning and they made certain they knew exactly what had to happen at every moment, every minute of that exercise. They knew exactly what had to happen. They had a very detailed plan. They also had fantastic teamwork, not just a, uh, within the team it's, that were there. There were different colored T-shirts that the different trades were using. So the arc, the uh, the uh, craftspeople that were working with the masons were working with one set. The electricians were working with another. The drywallers were wearing different color shirts. So there was really good teamwork within the team and amongst the other teams. So they all worked well together and they had trust in each other, which allowed them as a team to do really good things going far. And then they applied technology. I mentioned the concrete setting. They took technological advances, similar to how Uber took the advancements of everybody having mobile phones that could give geography and give payment. They took chemistry and were able to accelerate how quickly they could use that concrete. They also had a very competitive drive and an ambitious goal. They weren't just doing this because why not? Let's go out and see it. They did it because they were trying to break the world record in that example. So they had a very ambitious goal and that's why they were able to really strive. It was a, a group goal to try to achieve this world record. And they made sure they had the availability of all of the tools they were going to need in order to complete the exercise. They did a lot of practice as well. They talked in that video about doing a little bit of practice runs in advance of the one that we watched. And then they did parallel versus serial thinking. Again, that walls and roof example, they built the walls and the roof in parallel. 
And then they used the equipment. They used one of the tools that was available to them, a crane, to put the walls in place and lift the roof and put it on top. But they were able to process those two builds in parallel to save time. And lastly, again, they were going big or going home. They had a complete willingness and an outright desire to break the rules. They wanted to do whatever it was going to take to get that world record home built. So these are several of the things you guys in your own teams can think about how do these apply to your own projects and maybe to your own businesses or future businesses that you're going to create. Now, shifting a little bit to Silicon Valley culture, it's very consistent. We have an attitude here. It's kind of stated in this first bullet, disrupt or die. We don't want incremental change here in Silicon Valley. We want to look at the way things are done and break all the rules and disrupt them and create new value networks and that value that all those disruptors earn by being disruptors. And I talked about the diversity here, the multiculturalism. These are benefits to Silicon Valley. We are blessed to have a place here in Silicon Valley that attracts people from all over the world. Failure is not just accepted, it's expected. If you're interviewing at a company here in Silicon Valley, you will be asked to describe a failure you have had in your life and how you handled it. They don't want to hear, well, I haven't failed. If you haven't failed, you haven't tried hard enough is most likely the response you would get. So failure is expected here. People learn from failure. We all learn more, in fact, when things we think are going to happen don't happen. Now, you might call that a failure. Um, we think of them as learning opportunities, ways to grow and learn. As there's a famous inventor here, Thomas Edison, they say he tried 10,000 different ways to create light, the light bulb, none of which worked. So they said, wow, you failed 10,000 times. He said, no, I've learned 10,000 ways not to do it. And so it's just a different way to think about it. Now, I talked about us having uh, like a magnet for people from all cultures, all countries around the world, that gives us access to a wonderful talent pool of which we're able to, again, be fairly blessed to have such incredible talent from the globe coming here to Silicon Valley. One of the things that makes it so attractive is people who are innovators, entrepreneurs, they need capital. It's like a if you're not thinking about electric cars, it's like a traditional car needs gas. If you got to have gas in the tank, if you're going to go somewhere. Similarly, an entrepreneur needs capital in order to fund their innovation. Access to capital is no better place in the world for accessing capital for startups. Remember, 30% of every dollar of venture capital on the planet comes out of those three little boxes I showed you at the beginning. So there's great access to capital. We also have wonderful proximity to not just um, great industry, all those industries that I spoke about earlier, and more, and all great academia. We have such wonderful schools here. Cal and I were fortunate enough to go to UC Berkeley. Um, Cal's gone to other schools here in California. There's Stanford not far down the road here in Silicon Valley. So there's wonderful academia combined with wonderful industry. And there's also a spirit of openness and collaboration. People want to see other people succeed. That's um, just something that is very collaborative. It's really helpful when you need something from somebody in Silicon Valley. It's amazing how much they will, you know, try to be helpful to you and be collaborative and supportive of you. And success breeds success. When you have one company that's been successful, the people from that company then maybe go on and spread out and go to other companies and bring success to other companies. They bring that that experience of succeeding to other companies, which ultimately helps those companies uh, achieve success in higher proportions than in many other places. Now, when you're thinking about going to an investor and saying, hey, I have this great innovative idea, I think it's a disruptive innovation that I want to grow and foster, will you help me? They're expecting a handful of things. One, the biggest thing you need to understand that investors are concerned about is your team's ability to execute. You may have a great idea, but if you can't execute it, it doesn't really matter how great your idea is. So they're going to be thinking to themselves, how prepared, how capable is this group of entrepreneurs, these founders, 
to execute on this idea if they believe that it's a good idea. And you have to be able to tell a good story. You have to be able to communicate your idea and communicate its value to the market. You have to compute you know, communicate its competitive advantage. I know that was one of your upcoming um, trainings. You have to be able to say, why are you better? And how are you going to stay ahead of the competition? How are you going to defend your competitive advantage? That's part of telling the good story and making it very relatable. You also have to know if you have, and I don't know how many minutes you guys get in your pitch event, but if you're given five minutes or seven minutes, don't come to that pitch event with 24 slides. It's not going to work. You need to understand how much time you have and how to tell your story in a compelling and relatable way in the time that you are, are granted or allotted. So be sure to practice and practice again and practice again. Make sure you can tell your story in the right amount of time. Now, if you're a non-U.S. founder and you want to come to the U.S. and raise investment, you really need to have a U.S. entity and even a banking relationship here in the U.S. for the most part that will be more attractive and more appealing to a U.S. investor. U.S. investors don't frequently, it's not to say there's not exceptions, but they don't regularly invest in non-U.S. companies because we're much more familiar here, like you are where you're from, with the laws and the investment regulations here. So Cal and I are, are investors here in the United States. We understand the U.S. investment law, and we're very comfortable with U.S. banks. So we're looking for investments in U.S. entities that have U.S. banking relationships. Again, it's relevant to the U.S. companies, too. But if you're a foreign founder, it's definitely something you need to understand about how to raise capital from U.S. investors. I talked briefly about defensibility and IP. It's how are you going to defend your innovation from competition, from either copying it and that can be done with intellectual property like patents or trademarks or things, legal mechanisms to protect your innovation. And there are other business things you can do to protect your innovation. I don't know if any of you drink Coca-Cola. Their formula has never been patented. They maintain it, excuse me, as a trade secret. So they're using different ways to protect rather than having to file a patent within which they'd have to disclose more information than they really want to disclose. And I talked about at the beginning here, execution risk. That's the thing these people are thinking about. How do I make sure you're going to be able to execute? Bringing a winning team, showing a team that has experience, that has the energy, the enthusiasm, the grit, the perseverance, um, the growth mindset, willing to grow and learn along the journey. All of these things are demonstrating that you have a strong, winning, powerful team. And if you can get market traction, it's much better to say to somebody, I have a great idea Will you fund me, is one thing you could say. It's much better if you say, I have a great idea Will you fund me, and I have a lot of proof already in the market that the market wants my great idea. It's not just me hoping I have a great idea that the market will want. It's me showing you I already have traction in the market that demonstrates that the market wants what we've created. And one way to get a winning team and to accelerate your path to getting market traction is get a really strong group of advisors or a board of advisors. These are a less formal, they're formal relationships, but they're less formal than a board of directors, which is a much more formal relationship. And we encourage forming strong boards of advisors to test these people that you're going to bring on to help you and see if they're really maybe strong enough to rise to being a board of director, which again is an even closer and more formal relationship, or if they can just help you sufficiently as being an advisor. We bring wonderful advisors, very market credible advisors to a lot of the teams we work with, CEOs and former senior executives of some global, big, very recognizable companies we bring to some early stage startups because they're enthusiastic to help founders in the, work, in the area of their own business experience. So looking at boards of advisors is great. And investors really also look for businesses that can scale. There's nothing wrong if you said, my business idea is I want to create a restaurant or I want to create a lunch truck. That's a great idea. That could be a good business. 
but it's not going to scale very easily. And investors like to see businesses that can scale because scalable businesses can generally earn much, much larger amounts of money. And an investor really needs you to earn a lot of money in order to give them a return on their investment. And the last thing investors really want to see is that you understand their needs. Now, what I mean by that is if an investor, if you're going to go ask an investor, hey, would you invest in my business? They want to learn everything they can about your business. So they are going to ask you for all sorts of information. Now, I'm calling all of that information in total the due diligence report or the due diligence information. So make sure you have that ready to go. You don't want to be scrambling if somebody says, hey, you know what? I really love your idea. I'm interested. Send me some more information. That's not the time to start scrambling. So have it in order, have it ready to go. We call we use a term called link ready. It would be wonderful if they say, I'm interested. You say, great, give me your email address. I'm attaching a link. That is a link to all of our due diligence. That's something that Cal and I and our partners in Silicon Valley in your pocket offer to all of the companies that come through our programs. Now we're rounding the home stretch here, but when you're thinking about your pitches, here are some things that investors really look for. And this is the way we evaluate uh, pitch decks and pitch competitions very frequently. I saw that you had 20% across five different categories. They're all in here. We maybe added a few more based on how we um, evaluate submissions to us as either investors or just in helping our clients get ready to go out and meet investors. So these are very normal things. We need to know the problem and solution are a product market fit, that there's a good fit between this problem that's out there. It's real and you have a good solution for it. The value proposition, meaning what will somebody be benefited by using your solution? The secret sauce is your kind of intellectual property and your competitive landscape. You need to demonstrate that you understand where you fit within the landscape of other competitors and why you're differentiated and better. Then understanding the market size, how big of the market is this? It's a great idea. Do only three people in the world need it or do millions of people in the world need it? And if it is millions of people, how are you going to go and make them aware you exist? How are they going to know about you? What's your go-to-market strategy? Your business model, the team, as we spoke about a lot here, understanding your financials. I like to think about it as money in, money out. We're going to need to spend money, and we're going to need to bring in money in order to spend it. So how are we going to get money in in order to help us protect and cover the money out? The KPIs are the key performance indicators, the key metrics that you want to track. And then the traction, we spoke about designing or developing, excuse me, some market traction. And then how much are you looking for? That's your ask. What are you going to achieve with the ask? And when are you going to exit? Because investors generally are going to make their return when you have an exit. That could be an acquisition. That could be in a very, very small number of cases, an IPO, an initial public offering, it's very unlikely um, that most startups will have an IPO. The statistics are less than 1%, less than one fraction of 1% even, a small fraction of 1% actually do achieve that. And then just overall, does your story make sense? Does the presentation flow? And does it tell a compelling and relatable story? You're welcome to, and we'll give these slides out. Uh, these will be distributed to all of you, but you can um, go to this link or, or scan the QR code and do an assessment if you have a pitch deck. And, you know, we provide this, this kind of a report back. And with that, I want to thank everybody for your time. And we want to take any questions you guys may have. I see one already came in. Can you please explain KPIs more? Well, no better person than Cal to address <laughs> that one. <laughs> yeah, so KPIs are some of my favorite things. So like Jeff said, it stands for Key Performance Indicators. And it's the ways that you can measure the success and the viability of your business. So basic questions that somebody will ask you if you have a customer, how profitable is a customer? And there are some measures there again, more acronyms, ARPU, A-R-P-U, average revenue per user. How much do you make from the customer? Um, how much did it cost you to get the customer? 
that would be a customer acquisition cost. And then we can do some really fun stuff where we kind of measure the cost of acquiring the customer versus how quickly you earn back that acquisition cost. And then um, how long they stick around. There's something called a, a churn rate. So it really is something that there are so many different ways that you can measure different marketing campaigns, different sales campaigns. And believe it or not, investors really care about it. And uh, potentially, maybe someday we can do an entire session just on KPIs, which I love to do. We actually workshop it and can crunch some numbers in real time. Hopefully that helped. Thank you, Jeff and Carl, for this um, very wonderful training. And yeah, I personally also learned a lot. And I think uh, in particular, the, this um, investor's expectation would be very, very helpful for our teams when they're preparing for their pitching deck. So yeah, uh, of course, we will be sharing this presentation to the to, to the students and you're welcome to review the presentation and uh, even the recordings if you need as you prepare for your business plan or your pitching deck. And yeah, please continue to ask questions if you have any questions. Now we see another questions coming here. Here's one here. If you're implementing an idea that's already working around the world, has a good market, but isn't as successful in your region or country, there have been tries, but they stop almost as soon as they begin. Would it be a good idea to take such an idea on with a different approach? That is a really good question. In fact, one of the things um, we recommend to some founders around the world is they ex oftentimes people will express a desire to come to Silicon Valley. And we say that may be a good idea, but is Silicon Valley or is the United States the best market for your innovation? And sometimes we would discourage, meaning don't come here. It's not the best opportunity for you here. There are better places for your innovation. Now, similarly, we would say one way of coming up with a good idea is looking at other places and seeing what great ideas are working there. So I love this question um, because I feel like you can under you, what you have to do is look at the good idea and the places it's working and understand why is it working? What are the characteristics of the business? What are the characteristics of the culture, of the economy, where it is working? And would it likely also be able to succeed in your area? Sometimes there are regulations that prevent something from working in one place where those regulations don't exist in another place and it works perfectly well. I will tell you, I use Uber when I travel around the world fairly regularly, and there are some countries that don't allow Uber. The taxis have a very strong um, defense, if you will. And so Uber is not permitted. And for someone like myself, that's an inconvenience because now I'm like, I'm so used to having the Uber app. So would taking Uber to that market be a good idea? Probably not, even though it's working so well in so many other countries. So I think it's a great question, but I really, again, re reiterate, look at the characteristics of why is it successful in the countries that it's successful in and are those characteristics existing in the market that you're hoping to bring them to in this place maybe your region or your country i hope that helps yeah and actually building on that uh on everything jeff said spot on um stay tuned so next week we will do another session where we will be talking about uh product market fit and more importantly the value proposition, the value that your customers see in your offering, in your solution. And to Jeff's point, in different parts of the world, they will see the value differently. Some areas will value it more and some will value it less. And that is an important determinant in your go-to-market. Where in the world should you, should you go? And of course, you should also think about your competitors. And your competitors could be an existing company, or it could be something called the inertia of the status quo, which is just, oh, we're doing it a different way and we don't really need your solution. So all these things kind of influence a global expansion. And we've seen lots of cases where something that's spectacular in one country just doesn't take off in another. 
Thank you. And I noticed that Shah is raising your hand, right? I'm just unmuting you. Shah, would you like to ask your question? Hello, Shar, are you here? No. Oh, here we go, Shah, I wrote it. If the idea for startup looks a lot of futuristics, is it worth developing it? I don't quite understand that. Shah, can you uh, clarify? Do you, do you mean that it's too far out? It doesn't look like it's it's today's kind of environment, that it's, it's a technology that's very far away in the future? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay, you want to go, Kel, or um, um, go? sure, yeah. sure. Um, I actually lived this um, with one of my startups that I did. I was uh, looking at a, a streaming solution for showing movies, like in in the movie theater. And um, this was years ago, way way before we have you know TikTok and all these things that you can just kind of like watch high definition things on your phone. And um, it required before you could stream because you didn't have the bandwidth, there was something called a progressive download. So I had something that uh, the idea was there, but we needed technology that was just a little bit too slow and that kind of hurt our company. So um, some of these things, like we have been talking about artificial intelligence for decades. I mean, literally 20 years ago, there was already a movie called AI. And we all knew that these things could happen. And so we've been dreaming about these ideas. And very slowly, incrementally, we've seen it become you know, real. And suddenly it's now available to the mass market. And now we suddenly really experience the tipping point. And it is an important lesson that we have to kind of time you know, the big ideas, knowing the market adoption, and understanding if technology is ready to support the demand that the world has. And, um, you know, it, it's a very, you have to wear your futurist hat to really understand how technology will evolve and how the market will respond to it. Jeff, I don't know if you have stuff to add. Yeah, I will add a point here. I think um, it's a good question, Shah. And um, I, yeah. like Cal, I had one of my businesses, I mentioned in part of my journey, I got to meet Steve Jobs of Apple, the way I got to meet Steve Jobs was we developed a product in 1998. So a long time ago, 25 years ago already, we developed a product that is very similar to what we're using right now, which is Zoom. We developed a video and audio and collaboration tool, video and audio conferencing and a collaboration tool on top of Apple QuickTime, which was then a fairly new product. And then they had just launched the Windows version to take it from not just Mac, but to have a cross-platform Windows and Mac solution. And we built a video conferencing platform, very similar, as I said, to Zoom. But what we didn't think about was the bandwidth. The bandwidth back then was much, much, much slower. We're able to have a very good experience these days because bandwidth is, allows us to compress this video and audio and allow for us to have a great experience, generally speaking, using these technologies all across the world. As, as was said in the beginning, you guys are all over various countries. And of course, we're here in the United States and we're having a very good conversation because of the technology and the bandwidth. What we were unable to capitalize on was the bandwidth experience was, we were ahead of the bandwidth. We were we built a product that was too soon. It was more futuristic and we weren't savvy enough. So being early sometimes is a problem. But I'll give another example of someone we spoke about today in our discussion here was Netflix. Netflix used to mail in an envelope to your home DVDs and you would watch them on your DVD player that you all had in your houses. And you would then, when you were done, you would stick it back in an envelope and mail it back. So they said, one day, there's going to be a way for us to do this electronically, digitally, downloading. People will download the content. But right now, we're not there. And so we're going to build a business that optimizes for today, but has an eye toward the future. So to me, that is the answer to your question is look at what you can do today 
even if your eye is looking a little further out into the future to a better environment that might be more supportive of a technology um, that you have in mind or an innovation, I should say, that you have in mind. So I hope, Shah, that that um, gives a little bit of insight to the question. Looks like there's another question here. The cost of some of my projects is not easy to control and may not be profitable at the beginning of my project. How should I persuade my investors to invest in me? That's a great question as well. Mm -hmm. You know, many, many startups, I used the expression earlier when I was describing the financials and KPIs. I used an expression that says money in and money out. Now, the way you're going to build your financials, and we recommend a three-year monthly forecast. You should be able to look out about no more than really three years. Sometimes it gets a little further out. The further out you get, the less accurate it gets. And we don't even imagine that three years is accurate in terms of the numbers. What we, what we are looking for is give us your best guess of what will it cost you to operate your business over the next 36 months. And then let's say you forecast out that in the first year, you need $100,000. Well, then the question is, okay, I know over the next 12 months, I need 100,000 USD. How do I get it? Well, there's various ways. I can convince investors. I could put the money in myself if I have access to, to money myself. I could maybe go get a grant, or maybe I could borrow the money. And so you have to look at, those are all the money in sources, and you have to figure out which one can I get that will give me the money in that will cover the forecast that I have for money going out. So I think most businesses will start out in the negative and you have to earn your way towards because most people are spending money quicker than they're earning money, right? You have to build whatever your innovation is in order to monetize it or bring money in from it. So I think your situation is very regular, very normal for startups. And the way to convince people is that the opportunity is big enough and the team's capability is strong enough that you hopefully can convince them that invest in us, we have the capability to build this innovation, and the market is definitely eager to have an innovation like the one we're talking about. Cal, anything you would add there? I'm sure you have a different... Um, yeah, different I, I will um, add to what you talked um, during the presentation about your ask slide. And remember, Jeff was talking about your milestones. You're going to start with your milestones. This is what I'm going to accomplish. Give me some money and I will do X, Y, and Z. And that could be, I'm going to get 10,000 customers. And you should have a plan that says, I get 10,000 customers and each customer will give me $1,000, whatever that number is. So all these things, all these claims that you make and some of these KPIs, are really the building blocks of your business. So while the, the cost is real, um, it is so important that you articulate what you will produce and generate once you have that money. And it's not just building a product, it's, it's building a path to profitability and, and customers and so forth. And it's really important because when you ask for money, you're asking for investment. And if you can complete the story, and talk about getting customers and selling customers and having income to the company, then you finish the equation of ROI, return on investment. And you paint a richer picture for the investor to understand how the money will come back. And it's all part of just planning and really thinking about you know, what you can accomplish in the future. You know, one thing I'll add, and then I see a set, uh, another question um, here in the in the chat. But one thing I'll add as a concluding point to this topic: investors. If you were to go to an investor and say, "I need five million dollars to build my idea," it's unlikely they're going to say, "Oh, great, let me go get my checkbook and write you a five million dollar check." But if you said to an investor, "I need five million dollars over the next three years or four years," but just give me 250,000 USD and I'm gonna go do these things. So let's say the 5 million would accomplish 10 things or 15 things over three years. Important milestones, accomplishments in the business to, to show that it's moving towards a viable, sustainable and profitable business. So if you go to them and say, look, I really need $5 million to do what I wanna do. 
But I know you don't know us well, and you need to understand that we are capable of executing. And what I'd say is, if you give me $250,000, or maybe $500,000, I'm going to go and do the first three or four things on the list that the $5 million would buy. And they're pretty important things, the first three or four. And that way, maybe I'll do that over the next three months or four months. And if I show you that we can take in your capital as an investor, and we're going to deliver what we said we were going to deliver, I'll build confidence in you that our execution capability is there. So you don't have to raise all the money at one time. You can raise it in tranches or pieces and accomplish smaller subsets of all the things that need to be accomplished. And we recommend that strategy very regularly because you don't want to go in asking for too much money from people who don't really know you and have a way of understanding your execution capability. So think about breaking down your amount of investment into these smaller pieces or tranches and raising to accomplish specific milestones with the amount of the smaller amounts of money that you're able to convince them to give. I hope that helps uh, answer that a little bit. There is a question here. Are Silicon Valley venture investors open for ideas, not ready startup? If I will have a good idea, will it fly? I would say, and we actually um, train in this, investors don't invest in ideas. They invest in teams that can execute ideas. And so if you just come and say, I have a great idea, invest in it, and it's just yourself, in this case, Merdan, um, the likelihood of you getting investment is pretty small, if I'm being honest. But if you say, we've thought about it, here's our plan, here is our team. You notice I'm using our, which means more than just you, not my team, my plan. Here is our plan, here is our team, here's our execution capabilities, here's our experience. If you instill in them a confidence with an idea, you don't have to have the business that far along, but you have to have the the thought process of what can we do with this idea? How do we take this idea to market? All those things we talked about on the prior slide. If you have these nine vital signs well thought out, you can convince someone before you have really much more of the business um, to invest in it. It's, you know, it's more likely to get investment if you have more traction and more advanced that you could do without the investor's money and do it with other sources of money in, but you can get venture capitalists to invest in seed or pre-seed companies that are often at a, you know, slightly beyond the idea stage. I don't know, Cal, if you have anything to add in there. Yeah, I think it definitely de depends on what investors you're talking about. For many, many investors, they don't invest in ideas. And in fact, they don't even invest in products. They invest in companies. I mean, from an investment perspective, you need to have a company. And a company really is the encapsulation of these nine vital signs that Jeff just talked about. So uh, to the extent you're not, you know, check all the boxes yet, you have to head in that direction and you have to show confidence that you can do it. And maybe it'll take time. And, and sometimes you establish a relationship and then over time you can show them progress and, and traction and show that you're moving towards a viable business with a product, with the team, and then sort of win them over, over time. Thank you, Carr. Um, I noticed there's one question, actually, I think it's for me. Uh, where the <laughs> entire team have to pitch on the pitch day or only the leader can pitch. So each team will select one or two members to do the presentation. One is great. If you want to have two, that's also good. So yeah, it doesn't have to be the team leader. It could be any anyone from the team, anyone who wants to represent the team to talk about your business idea and solutions. And yeah, so uh, we'll be taking two more questions. If if you still have any more questions. Uh, Jeff and Carl actually answered a lot of questions today, and thank you so much for for your of patience course. for for your great answers. Oh, happy to do it. Happy yeah. to do it. If there is a question or two more, we're happy to answer those as well. Yeah. So uh, we have 
um, some more time for the questions. And actually, I I noticed this um, the one the one slide that we have right now investor readiness self assessment. Um, I I think if uh, the teams already have their pitch deck ready, it would be a great tool to also do a self assessment of your uh, of your business plan or your um, pitch deck. This looks like a great tool. And yo, actually, perhaps Jeff or Carl, if you want, you could also talk a bit about the resources that is available, um, especially the free resources available yeah. uh, for our students, yeah. like on your on your website. Cal, you want to go for that? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, first of all, we have some really fun top ten lists. So we do. Jeff and I have done these together. Top ten lists on top ten freebies. Um, you know, you have to bootstrap. What are some free things you can get out there to, to start a, a business? Um, we also believe a lot in checklists and guides. So one really important one is the story flow. How do you build the story? And you can get a little PDF guide that breaks apart these, you know, the nine vital signs and kind of helps you formulate the story. And then we even link out to some resources about, you know, competitive analysis and things like that. We have a list of 105 investor questions. So part of the whole thing is, you know, you doing a pitch, but almost kind of more important is actually you being able to answer the tough questions that investors ask during questions and answers. So this way we give you the 105 most common investor questions. And again, it's a really, really good exercise to kind of uh, role play with your colleagues, with your other students, and practice hearing the hard questions and then being ready with good answers to those hard questions. Um, it's really important. They wanna see you as a CEO that can lead the company and being prepared and confident is always really, really important. And we have lots of other guides like that as well. Great, thank you so much, Carl. And um, so please feel free to explore those available resources online. Actually, there are so many resources available online to help you um, start preparing for your business plan and your pitching deck and to start your startup as well. And so I am posting the feedback survey in the chat box. Please take a few minutes to complete the feedback survey. and. Um, so Jeff, you're sharing the screen, right? Can I change to my screen? I there you go. Yeah, sure. Actually, just want to talk a little bit about next week's workshop. So, yep, as we have already mentioned, next week we'll be having our fourth training workshop. on naming the customer value proposition. And um, we believe this session is uh, very important in helping the teams to reflect on your feasibility report and to understand your customers better. So please stay tuned and uh, be ready to attend next week's session. That will be on Friday, the so 17th of March, Friday, the same time from 2 p.m. to 3.30. And yeah, and that's that's it from me. I will be staying for like two, three more minutes if any of you still have questions. And yeah, other than that, I am, yeah, I think that's it from me. Please take a few minutes to complete the feedback survey. Uh, if you still have questions, you can write to me. And I normally reply message every day. So um, for T, EDU developer teams, I will check my message again and I'll make sure I reply to you today. Right. So um, thank you so much, Jeff and Carl. Thank you for the great training. Um, we have learned a lot from you. Thank you for the collaboration and support. Always happy thank to do you. it. Thank, thank you very, very much, everybody. <laughs> and we wish you all good luck on your progress between now and next week. And of course, even beyond to your pitch day. Thank you, thank you.
And um, okay. yeah, please feel free to uh -huh. leave the meeting. We will be closing the meeting in two minutes. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. And I will stay for one more minute if anyone have questions. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, we're closing the meeting now. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.